On the first day of creation, God made the light and separated it from the darkness. And for three days, light shone upon the earth without a light source. Now on the fourth day, God creates the heavenly bodies from which those lights striking the earth come. And he tells us amazingly that the purpose of all these heavenly bodies is to give light on the earth. We'll see that today. Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. James Jones, the pastor of the DeRitter Presbyterian Church in DeRitter, Louisiana. I'm glad you're worshiping with us today. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we look at your activity on the fourth day of creation, we pray that you would enable us to understand the truth and that we would stand in awe of you as a result. Please forgive our sins, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Hear the word of God. I am reading today from Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 through 19. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Amen. This is God's holy, inspired, inerrant word. May he add his wonderful blessing to our understanding of the truth today. We saw in our study of the first day of creation that God made light and separated the light from the darkness on the first day. And so for the first three days of creation, light has been shining upon the earth without any light bearers, without any object, physical object, shining that light. We know that God is able to do this because he tells us that he will do this in the new heavens and the new earth. Now, on the fourth day, God creates the lights in the firmament or the lights in the heavens. This term lights means light bearers, and it's different from the word that's used in verse 1. In verse 1, there's a general term for light in the Hebrew, or, and here this term is related to that, it's uh, ma-or, which means light bearers. It's used of lamps, for example, the lamps in the sanctuary uh, of the tabernacle and the temple. And so these are light bearing objects that God creates. God does this once again by simply speaking his divine powerful word and he calls into existence all of these light-bearing objects, which are the sun and the moon and the stars. Yet he uses, in this case, the raw materials that he made on the first day. Remember, on the first day, he called all things into existence out of absolutely nothing. But now God does call into existence these light-bearing objects and yet he uses in their creation the material that he had made on the first day. We know this because uh, the verb made is used here. And that verb made indicates to fashion something out of raw material. And so God made these light bearing objects and placed them in their exact orbits in the sky as he had planned and as he has ordained. These lights in the firmament of the heavens serve three purposes in the plan of God that he outlines for us here. To divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. 
So when God creates the light-bearing objects that we will call the sun and moon and stars, he does so for a purpose, and that purpose is outlined in these verses. First, and notice that the purpose is earth-centric. All of the purpose for which the sun and the moon and the stars exist is in terms of their relationship to the earth. And so chapter 1, as I've mentioned before, is earth-centric. It revolves around what happens on the earth because of God's creation. So the first purpose that he mentions here is to divide the day from the night. Now we saw that in general, uh, God divided light from darkness on day one and called the light day and the darkness night. But what he does here is he creates these light bearing objects so that they serve to divide the day from the night. And so from our vantage point, standing on the earth, we see the sun rise in the morning proceed to noon, and then go down in the evening. We see the moon and the stars come out at night and shine and then fade away in the morning. And so what God is telling us here is the way in which we normally perceive these objects in the sky, that they divide the, the light from the darkness, the day from the night. And so uh, the sun uh, is set for the daytime and the moon and the stars for the night. That's the first use. The second purpose, the second use, is to serve as signs. Now, we'll see more about signs toward the end of this message. But what he's getting at here, perhaps, is the idea of the use of these heavenly bodies for, uh, for example, navigation at sea, that we can navigate by the stars or for uh, determining the weather. We can uh, notice the, uh, the, the type of sky around us. Jesus tells us this sort of thing as well, that we can determine the type of weather that's coming because of the appearance of the sky. Also, uh, the weather is affected by the moon. Uh, the moon causes high and low tides based on its orbit around the earth. Uh, these things are, therefore, signs of God's activity. But also, uh, in rare cases, they are signs both of God's blessing and of God's judgment as well. The star that rose in the east at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ was a sign that heralded the birth of the Messiah. We read in Matthew 2, verses 1 and 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. So the star heralded the birth of the Messiah, the king of the Jews. The sun and the moon and the stars being affected in some symbolic way often herald the downfall of great kingdoms or the uh, curse of God upon something. So in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Even more importantly, the supernatural darkness that came upon the land during the time that Christ was on the cross was an indication of God's pouring out His curse upon His only begotten Son as He bore our sins and received the punishment for our sins upon the cross. And so we read in Matthew 27, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. Now, let me hasten to add, this was not an eclipse. No eclipse lasts for th three hours to begin with. And if you will understand the time in which the Passover is celebrated, it's always at a full moon. 
And when the moon is full, it is on the opposite side of the earth and cannot cause an eclipse. And so this was a supernatural darkness that heralded the outpouring of God's holy wrath upon his son who was bearing the sins of all of the elect of God in our place. These lights in the sky also serve for seasons. God establishes the regular passage of time in this verse. And the Bible therefore speaks often of the seasons passing. It speaks of springtime. It speaks of harvest. Uh, for days, the sun uh, marks the beginning of each new day. And so every day is marked out in this way by these heavenly bodies. And years, finally, uh, God made these signs in the sky to mark out uh, years for us so that we can have calendars. We can uh, look at the length of our lives. We can see the passage of days and months and years by the heavenly bodies that God has established. Now, not only do we human beings benefit from these objects that God has placed in the firmament of the heaven, but so do the animals as well. Birds migrate in different seasons. Bears hibernate in winter. And so the animal kingdom is affected by the days and the months and the seasons and the years. And all of these things are done by God in relationship to the earth that God has made. Which brings us to the third and final reason for which God placed these objects in the sky. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. It was for this reason that God created these heavenly bodies, this last purpose. They were made so that they might shine upon the earth. Now, we've already seen and talked about the fact that in the Bible, uh, the Bible does not say that the earth is the center of the universe or the center of the solar system. We know that this is not true physically. However, the Bible does teach that the earth is central to God's holy purposes, and therefore, the rest of creation is mentioned only as it relates to life on this earth and specifically and particularly to mankind. Uh, therefore, what we see is that while the earth is not the center of the universe, the earth is central to God's plan and therefore we can confidently say that the earth is the center of the universe theologically. Moses goes on to record God saying, then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day. In relationship to our earth, the sun is the greater light that dominates the daytime. It was apparently from this direction that God initially sent light upon the earth on the first day. And now God makes that great light bearer that we call the sun. And he causes it to shine light. But the theological idea here is that God is the light itself and that God shines his light by means of this light bearer, which is a lamp he has created to shine light upon the earth. Uh, the Bible does not name the sun here. Notice God doesn't give it a name. We know it as the sun. We know that that's what's being referred to. Why does he not mention it as the sun? Well, let's recall that the one writing these things down is Moses, who is receiving revelation from Almighty God. And by Moses' day, the sun in the sky was already being worshipped by pagan peoples. For example, in Egypt, the sun god was Ra, one of the major gods of uh, their pantheon. And he was worshipped, uh, the sun was also worshipped by other pagan tribes as well. And since God will not share his glory with anything or anyone, 
he does not even dignify giving the Son its name in this verse because he does not want anyone to worship the creation. He does not mention the name here then to exalt the Son to a position of worship that belongs to him and to him alone. And the lesser light to rule the night. And so God does the same thing here with the moon. He does not mention the name of the moon, but he calls it the lesser light that rules the night. Once again, pagan cultures worship the moon as a moon god. And so God does not want them to worship his creation, but to worship him alone. And so he merely calls the moon the lesser light. Uh, it, isn't it interesting? The moon is a, is a weird object when you think about it. God has placed it at exactly the right distance from the earth to create the tides so that we have high tide and low tide. He has made it to uh, revolve around the earth in such a way that one face is always facing us and the other is always facing away. Uh, he has uh, created it in such a way and at such a distance that relatively, even though the moon is smaller than the earth and fantastically smaller than the sun, yet uh, the moon can block out the sun during a solar eclipse. And so all of these things are part of God's divine plan. Just like the sun, the moon and the stars bring glory to God alone. Psalm 136 says this, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. To Him who made the great lights, for His mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for His mercy endures forever. And the moon and stars to rule by night, for His mercy endures forever. And this brings us now to the stars. In what seems like almost a throwaway remark, God says he made the stars also. Now, the Bible indicates this in the original Hebrew. Uh, it says God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, the stars also. And so the vast number, the vast array of the stars in the night sky is an also in the plan of Almighty God. If you have ever been somewhere where there is not a great deal of light pollution at night so that you could look up at the heavens and see the vast number of stars there above you, it is awe-inspiring. It will take your breath away. But the awe-inspiring nature of the stars is not to give glory to them or to the creation, but to the Creator who made them. That's the reason they exist, is to bring glory to Him and also for the purpose of shining light upon the earth. And so all of creation exists for the purpose of glorifying its Creator. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. In spite of the vast number of stars in the sky that we can see, and even those that we cannot see because they're so far away that our human eyes cannot detect them, and even the most advanced telescopes can barely see them, if at all, God created all of them. He created all of them all at once, and He created each one as He determined it to be. Psalm 147 says, He counts the number of the stars. He calls them by name. Great is the Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. Think about that for just a second. When you stand out at night and look at the sky and you see that vast number of stars that are there that you're able to see, and you couldn't begin to count them. Instead, what you recognize is that they are there for the purpose of bringing glory to God and shining light on the earth, and that God 
is able to count them, and that God has given a name to every one of them. And that's why the psalmist in awe says his understanding is infinite. God named all of the stars. Now, the point of all of this uh, is that God made the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the light coming from these objects. Some folks who objected back in verse 1 that light could exist without a light bearer might be among those who at this verse would say, wait a minute, what about light coming from distant stars? This is called the uh, light from distant stars problem. How could that light come to the earth since light travels at a constant speed of 186,000 miles a second. Uh, How could light striking the earth indicate a young earth that is only thousands of years old because we know that it would take light from those distant stars millions of years to reach the earth. What do you say about that? They confidently assert. Well, It's begging the question in at least two areas. Number one, that light speed is and always has been a constant. And number two, that light at the creation had to follow those rules of light speed if it is a constant. In other words, the solution can either be light does not always travel at a constant speed. It seems to for us but it may not. I read a paper recently, a scientific paper, uh, that had math that was beyond my ability to fully follow, although I did understand the conclusions being drawn. And that math that was presented here was that light might not be a constant speed going and coming from an object. It might arrive instantaneously from an object and then only by average in returning to Uh, the light source may that light speed average out to what we consider to be the constant speed of light. Like I said, I don't understand the math, but there are mathematicians who do uh, and who stand by this idea. The other answer I think is probably the best, and that is that God is all powerful. God can easily have created the light to arrive instantaneously on the earth from those light-bearing objects the second he created them. And so it didn't have to take time to travel. It was here instantly because of creation. Uh, God created the light and the light-bearers and the light striking the earth all at once is what is being said. So this entire argument has to do with the power and the will of Almighty God. Can he create in the way that he says he created? The answer for all believers is yes, absolutely he can because he says he did. And that's what we trust in today. The scripture tells us how he did it. And so we, in humility, uh, fall at the feet of our creator and say, Lord, it is good that you have made these things in this way for they bring glory to you and to you alone. So the bottom line for all of these heavenly bodies that exist is that they were created by God on the fourth day of creation. They were made for the primary purpose of glorifying Him and for the secondary purpose, God tells us, of shining light upon the earth. And that's what they do very well. Let's return now to one of those purposes that we looked at earlier, that God created the stars to serve as signs, the sun, moon, and stars to serve as signs. Now, God condemns throughout Scripture the practice of astrology, uh, the worship of heavenly bodies that is absolutely roundly and soundly condemned everywhere in the Bible. But he does often use the sun, moon, and stars to illustrate his divine plans. The number of stars in Scripture is likened sometimes to the number of God's elect who are 
His children by His grace. In making His covenant with Abraham, God said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, He brought him, God brought Abraham outside and said, Look now toward the heaven and count the stars if you are able and uh, to number them. And he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Now what God was telling Abraham there was, and Abraham at that particular moment did not have the child of promise. Isaac had not yet been conceived and born. And God is giving him this marvelous promise. Abraham, you who are childless, in essence, you will be the father of many nations. Your children will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And when we get to the New Testament in the letter to the Galatians, Paul reminds us Christians that we are Abraham's seed. We are heirs according to the promise that's given to Abraham. And so we are included in that vast array of God's elect people, which answers one of those questions, will there be few who will be saved? Because if we're likened to the stars of the heavens that cannot be counted, then the number of God's elect is a vast number. What a marvelous thing to know that God is that merciful and gracious to his people. We're as numerous as the stars of the sky, in Philippians, the Apostle Paul likens us to lights. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. And he calls us children of light in his letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5. For you were once darkness, but now are you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ himself calls his disciples lights. In Matthew chapter 5, he says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So the light that we are, that we are to shine, brings glory to God as men observe us following God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are lights shining in a sin-darkened world. Are you among those whom Christ calls light in the darkness. Are you a Christian? If you are, this describes you. You are a light to the world by your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you are not, you are still in darkness and are walking in darkness and you need to repent of your sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in so doing, not only are you saved, but you are then counted among the number who are lights shining in this sin-dark world. And so if you've never done so before, I urge you to do so now. Trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation and go from being darkness to light in the kingdom of God. Amen. Let us pray once again. Almighty and gracious God, how we thank you that you set the sun, the moon, and the stars in their orbits in the sky, that you have a purpose for them, and that they serve that purpose perfectly. And Father, we thank you that they symbolically serve as signs of your people, that we are as numerous as the stars in the heaven and that we are lights that shine in a dark, sinful world on earth. Bless us to do so. And Father, once again, my prayer is for any watching or listening who do not know Christ, that today might be the day of their salvation, that they would turn from sin and trust in Jesus Christ by faith. Please grant that they might do so for your glory and your honor. 
I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with me this week, and I look forward to continuing our study in the book of Genesis next time.